the Holy Spirit will teach you all things. The Lord be with you. And be your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O We are reading from John chapter 14, verses 15 and 16, then 23 to 26. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor and be with you forever. If a man loves me, he will keep my word, and my father will love him. And he will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Today, as we were reminded, we celebrate the Pentecost. Pentecost means the 50th. It is a feast celebrated on the 50th day after the Passover feast by the Jews and a feast celebrated on the 50th day after the feast of the resurrection of Jesus by the Christians. The Jewish Pentecost was originally a post-harvest Thanksgiving feast. Later, the Jews included it in the remembrance of God's covenant with Noah after the deluge and with Moses at Mount Sinai. When Jesus was about to go to the Father, he tells his disciples that he would not leave them alone. He would send another of the same kind as to be with them. And this was the Holy Spirit. We read this in John 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I am telling you the truth. It is for your benefit that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the counselor will not come to you. If I go, I will send him to you. John 16, verse 7. Jesus saw it necessary for the Holy Spirit to come and live in the believers because the new covenant has a new way of life. That is, human beings operating with the Holy Spirit within. And that is us, you know. Unfortunately, many believers live their lives ignoring the Spirit. There's somebody who told me the other day that, uh, you know, Father, nowadays we are observing that uh, you preachers are preaching a lot 
and saying almost nothing about the Holy Spirit. Yet, it is not possible to live the life of Jesus, to live a life that Jesus wants us to live without the help of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, dear good people, allow me to share with you five reasons why we need the Holy Spirit, each one, one of us. Number one, the Holy Spirit empowers us to witness, to be witnesses of Jesus. The power we have to be witnesses of Jesus is not given by any other source. It is given to us by the Holy Spirit. One of the reasons that the Holy Spirit came is to give us the power, the power and boldness to be true witnesses of Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit come on you and you will be my witnesses. Many people are quite afraid to speak about Jesus or believe they are unqualified. I don't know how many of you seated here in the company of non-believers would stand and boldly speak about Jesus. Sometimes we think we are unqualified. I don't know what would happen if I came to your church uh, one Sunday and I say one of you stand and come and preach. Then from there excuses start coming one after the other. I you know, Father, my throat has been unwell. You know, my eyes don't see very far. <laughs> my, my voice is not very good. You know, I have not studied the catechism. I am not baptized. I am not this. I am not the other one. And if you look at it, it is the same boldness that we lack to defend our faith. Sometimes we are bombarded by so many vibes, negative from outside. And for lack of boldness and courage, we say the, the useless, the useless old adage that if you cannot beat them, join them. That is not true. That adage is not very straight. There comes a time, dear young people, there comes a time that even if you stand alone against a thousand, you stand a witness for truth. If a lie is told a million times, it does not become a truth. And if you be at some point the only person speaking that truth against a multitude of others, in this context, what you need is the presence of the Holy Spirit to stand because, and I tell you this for a fact, I've been in this world longer than all of you. There will come a time when you'll be standing on your own because the world, and you go and read John chapter 1, verse 1 to 18. Uh, many a times we live with the people who love darkness more than light. Lies more than truth. But even if it becomes that time it is you who stands contrasting everybody else, this is where we need the presence of the Holy Spirit to that so that we can stand and witness to the truth. Number, one. Number two, the Holy Spirit makes us able to worship God. Did you know that true worship and a meaningful worship cannot be done without the presence of the Holy Spirit. You will see a people worshipping. And a people who are worshipping minus the, the presence of the Spirit 
It's very evident that you can be able to see that. Because it happens. Because we try to, to sing, to make statement, to pray and shout, to make statement, to do this or the other one, to make statement. No, when the Spirit comes, our worship just flows. And you don't strain. The moment you find yourself straining to worship, it means you are on your own trying to make statement. They are making statement to nobody because when you, when you try to worship to make statement, it only means that you are an agent of darkness. With the Spirit, then we are able, we are able to worship. I don't know whether you have ever heard this statement. Leo church is going to ball. Have you ever heard that? If you ever hear that statement, just know the person in front of you is a human being minus the Spirit of God. Did you know, minus the presence of the Spirit, there is nothing enticing about worship? There is nothing attractive about the church. We find ourselves burdened to go and worship. We find ourselves bored. No, you know, today the mass was boring. Mass was not boring. It is you who has all along been boring. Only that we have never told you. Today, we decided to tell you the truth. Because when we do not have the spirit, even the worship itself becomes cumbersome. You go for service or for mass, it's supposed to take about two hours, and already you are tired the first 20 minutes. That tells you there's a problem. And it is not only there, it also happens on the other side of ourselves, the preachers. I've always said that uh, to appreciate preaching, you need to be in the presence of the Spirit. Because preaching is not about academic knowledge. There is a course taught in the seminary called homiletics. Um, in the Protestant world, it is called the art of delivery, or how to deliver a sermon. It is taught in class and examined. And you may get an A academically. And in terms of delivery, then you are at zero. Because it is not the academic knowledge that is needed to preach. It is part. But what is so important, it is the presence of the Spirit. Because again, dear good people, preaching is a gift. It is not something you get because you are in the university or in some major seminary or in some, some theological college or in some other place. And we too can also be in front of people minus the Holy Spirit. So you can imagine how it can be a preacher who has no presence of the Holy Spirit and a congregation that is in stark darkness. That is not a church. It is a conglomeration of lost souls. When we have the Spirit, when we come together, even in our small groups of worship, we are able to make meaning out of it. I don't know whether you have ever met to worship. Maybe you were two or three, and you said your prayers, you read the Bible, and you went home, and you felt edified. Why did you feel edified? Because it was the working of the Spirit. I don't know whether alone you have ever gone into prayer and you prayed and you felt the presence of God. That is what the Holy Spirit does. It is, as you, you'd, you'd want to put it, the spicing up of the worship celebration. Number three, the Holy Spirit gives us supernatural gifts. The Christian life is supernatural in its own sense. 
Therefore, every believer has been given a supernatural gift by the Holy Spirit. You may want to think about it. The Holy Spirit has given you a spiritual, supernatural manifestation. What you mean to ask is, do you know your gift yet? And if you do not know your spirit, go to him and pray. Ask God to reveal to you the gift that you have. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 to 11, it is so clear. Allow me to read this one for you. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For no one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to no other the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gift of healing by one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 11. I know I have said this a million times, that each one of us is gifted differently. And you cannot fight somebody who is doing what you cannot, because maybe your spirit is different. I mean, your gift is different. If someone is speaking in tongues, Stop drawing a, a confrontation out of it. Let me tell you today as your priest and servant, not everybody can speak in tongues. Not everybody. It's a gift to some. Not everybody has a gift of the prophecy. Not. Not everyone has a gift of preaching. Not everyone has a gift of administration. Not everyone. But God, we have been given each one of us a gift. So if you find your friend speaking in tongues, thank God that he or she knows her path. If you have not known your path, ask him to show you. Because each one of us is gifted and gifted in the best way. The best we can do is to appreciate one another. And knowing that all these gifts are supposed to build the kingdom of God. If all of us were prophets, then we would have nobody for healing. If all of us were healers, then we would have nobody for administration. Then if all of us were administrators, we would have then nobody to preach to us, and so forth and, and so forth. If we can be able to know that, then we, we say thank you to the gift of the Spirit. And what it is that I'm gifted, I use it maximally for the greater glory of God. Number four, the Holy Spirit anoints us to do our purpose. One of the functions of the Holy Spirit is to anoint us for our purpose. The anointing is a supernatural empowerment to do the will of God. A supernatural empowerment to do the will of God. It can be grace for business, grace for science, grace for construction, grace for ministry. You can mention them. It is a special anointing. I am sure you have ever heard people say, uh, this person has the hand of business. Have you ever heard that statement? The hand of business. That is a special empowerment given by the Spirit. It has nothing to do with the family where you are born. You can be born by parents who are business people. Your mom is a business owner. Your dad the same. 
and you end up being a pastor. Or your mother can be a pastor, your dad a pastor, and you end up in the healing ministry. Or you may end up being a teacher. Because the anointing is special for everyone. And each one of us has a unique anointing. In fact, what we need to be asking is, uh, what am I anointed to do? But you see, you can't ask that if already you do not know your destiny and your purpose on earth. Why are you living today? Once you know your purpose, then you will know that with your purpose, you are going to be anointed, anointed for that. If somebody is doing very well in some area, that could be their anointing. Pray that they thrive there and that you pray for yourself, that you also become good in whatever it is that you are doing. The anointing gives us the success. We succeed because of the anointing. We are anointed by God just as Jesus was. And if we do not know our purpose, we may not find our anointing. Once we know our purpose, then you know we find our anointing. And then we will succeed, not because we are good Christians, not because our families succeed, not because I am properly trained, but because I have received the special empowerment. If there is an area that you are struggling, please pray. Pray for that special empowerment so that success can come upon you. I say all the time when I do business worship that not everybody is called to business because business is a calling. But again, once you are called to do business, pray for the empowerment. Because you may, be having a, an, uh, you may be having a calling, but because of the lack of the anointing, you mismanage the calling that God has given you. It's just like, like God giving you um, a vocation to marriage. <clears throat> you get a spouse. Along the line, you squander the gift. You break up your marriage. And then you keep on telling us that uh, marriages don't work. Marriages work all the time. Sometimes we have a calling, but then we mismanage. We mismanage the call. One way of emerging victorious is when we are able to pray for the special anointing, to be empowered to be able to sustain the calling that God has given each one of us to succeed in that calling. Number five, we need to cultivate, to cultivate the spirit of forgiveness. The Feast of Pentecost offers us a chance to look at the role which forgiveness should play in our dealings with others. Thus, today, we are challenged to examine our sense of compassion, our sense of patience, our sense of tolerance, and our sense of magnanimity. Once we are able to, to examine that, then we, we learn that we have a duty. In our own small ways, a duty to forgive others. And remember, good people, that forgiveness is a lifelong task. But the Holy Spirit is with us to make us agents of forgiveness. If we are prepared on this day of Pentecost to receive the Holy Spirit into our lives, then we can have confidence that our lives will be marked by the spirit of forgiveness, that we will be special agents of forgiveness. But again, having received, then we are reminded that we have a duty. We have a duty, good people, 
to cultivate this spirit of forgiveness. I know if I was to ask you, uh, maybe each one of you has one person or two whom they want to, or they have been struggling to forgive. Some of us have been struggling to forgive our parents. Others to forgive our spouses. Others to forgive our boyfriends and girlfriends. Others to forgive our business partners. Others to forgive our religious leaders. Others to forgive our brothers and our sisters. To some of us, we may be stuck because the persons we have been trying to forgive are already dead. And let me tell you today, I know I have been teaching this subject for many years. There is nothing as difficult as struggling with the forgiveness with a dead person. Part of what makes forgiveness impossible is death. Because the best forgiveness is the one we call transacted forgiveness. Transacted is where the two parties engage in mutual trust, confidence, and love. That yes, you did this to me. I admit I did wrong to you. I request that you forgive me and I forgive you. At that point, I become the beneficiary and you become the, the beneficiary. However, when that is not possible, I will still forgive because I know I am the first beneficiary. But for we, me to be able to, to, ha, to prepare that atmosphere where I will wake up and say, enough is enough. I've carried this person for far too long. Today is the day I put them down and I move on. Enough is enough. I have cried enough. I have pained enough. I have agonized enough. I have lamented enough. I have grieved enough. My life has been characterized by agony, frustration, whining, and pining, and lamentation. You wake up one day and say, I was not meant for this. And because I was not meant for this, I need to remind myself some things. One of them is that I have been forgiven myself. And because I have been forgiven, I will forgive her. And because I have been forgiven, I will forgive him. The other thing that is so important, I don't know how you have, whether you have ever thought about it, is that uh, seeing how God has been working through the actions of the offender. Sometimes the offender could be an agent sent by God to remove you from your comfort zone. Sometimes we, we never see it that way. And maybe you are, you, are, you, are, you are crying that this person did this or the other one. Maybe later you may be able to see the sea of aligning. There is always a message that God communicates to us. The problem is we never see that silver lining. Somebody may have worked so hard to make sure that you do not stay in a certain job and you are sacked and you've been making noise and you never knew that maybe you are so comfortable. God wanted, through the, the, the working of, of the offender, that you go somewhere that you can grow. Maybe somebody, then maybe you're complaining that so-and-so stopped a certain relationship. Maybe they had seen what you have not seen. And maybe if you don't listen, maybe one day you end up being where you are, where the person was. They told you that, you know, that gentleman is not good. And I know so many 
our gracious young girls have made this mistake. Somebody told them that uh, uh, that gentleman is not very good. How I wish you can reconsider your decision. And then she thought that uh, they were being unfair to her. It was jealous. It was jealousy. It wasn't jealousy. Those who listened, later they will say, oh, if I didn't listen to them, I would be in trouble by now. Those who thought that somebody was trying to sneak in and take up their threads, then they said, I wish I knew. I wish I listened. Sometimes the person we are so angry at is the person who saved our tomorrow. Somebody who saved you from in eternal damnation. Somebody who stopped you from being used and misused. Somebody who saved you from a situation of embarrassment and dehumanization. Somebody who had your tomorrow in their mind and in their heart. Think about the person you cannot forgive. Think about what they did. As a mature Christian, try to see whether there is something that God would want you to know. The other thing is invest in the life of your offender. This is the most difficult part. Investing in the life of the offender. We believe in investing in the lives of the persons we love. That we believe in. But there's something, big, something bigger than this. Investing in the life of our offenders. How do we do this? You can do this by praying for them. I, I know I, I had asked this question sometimes back, I think sometimes last year, but I wouldn't mind to ask it again. I'm assuming that uh, I worked with you and I engineered your sucking unfairly. I said so many bad things about you. And eventually you are fired. Now I'm, 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 I'm there. Time rolls. I am out, out of employment. God opened avenues for you. Now you are a boss somewhere. Tomorrow, my son comes to look for a job. And you are the final say. Remember what I did for you. I made sure that you even did, did not even receive your benefits. You went crying, and I was left behind dancing. But my son is coming to you for help. What will you do? Please talk. What will you do? You kill my son. <laughs> what will you do? Tell the son that your dad is a thief or your dad is a witch. You see, humanly speaking, you would feel that this is my moment of shining and revenge, isn't it? But there is a better way for those who, are, who have matured in their faith. You can invest in my life. You could be the reason why I'll get transformed differentiate between our differences and the needs of my son. Investing in my life is helping my son, knowing too well what I did for you. Maybe tomorrow I need some financial assistance. And again, I have injured you. Maybe I need some money for medication. And I have called for a fast drive. Will you fail to come because, because I injured you? No, you'll come and make some donation. That is called investing in the life of an offender. Dear good people, this is not possible for everyone. This is only possible for them who have known who Christ is and those who have known him at a personal level. Those who operate in spirit. Those who operate in spirit will do what I'm talking about because it is not simple. Investing. Sometimes you need even to give gifts, material gifts. 
That is called investing in the life of the offender. If you can do that, then you can easily forgive. If you can do that, you can easily forgive. The other thing is that uh, focus on the facts. The issues that were surrounding what happened. What are the facts? Leave out that which was blown out of proportion. But ask yourself, what does the... I'm sure in every place that you live, at home or even at work, there are some rules set aside. And that's so that here you do this or this or this. The rules that are set, they're supposed to be followed by us. Maybe I didn't follow one. What does the policy say? The policy says, I do this and that. Did I do what the policy says? No. That is a fact. What does the, what does the policy say that should be the repercussion? The repercussion would be you, some salary is deducted. Is that a fact? Yes, that's a fact. Once you lay down the facts, then you realize that the pain is mitigated because now you start owning up to the mess. Had I not started this, it would not have gone where it did go. Now, dear good people, there again, you need the presence of wisdom, a gift of the Spirit again. Once we have done all those things, it becomes possible for us to forgive our offenders. It becomes possible for us even to enjoy the life we enjoy as Christians. Pentecost is not just about speaking in tongues. Pentecost is also more about bringing home those who have gone away emotionally. It is also about bringing home those who have gone away spiritually. It is about remembering who we are in Christ. It is also about thinking about the family unity. We have ever talked about being of one mind and one heart as a family. Today I know you know of families that cannot interact one-on-one. -on -one. I know you know of families where your brothers and sisters cannot speak to one another. I know you know of families where sons and daughters cannot talk to their parents. I know I have been in various celebrations. We were burying a, a gracious lady another day. She has eight daughters, and four daughters could not come for the body of their mother because they didn't like her. Four came. That is the lot of our families. We are in times where we are in a church like here. This is the congregation. Maybe we sing together, but we cannot commune together after this. We only sing together, but there we are sworn enemies. But in church, the way we do things in church, you might think that uh, we, we, we are well encountered, but our lives is different. Pentecost tells us to look at our situations. Pentecost tells us to look at our honesty. Pentecost tells us to look at how we treat one another. Pentecost tells us to review our perspective and our worldview. And knowing that not everybody will be kind to us. And because not everybody will be kind to us, then we will have to be patient enough for the other person to be, uh, to be saved. We will be patient enough for the other person to see what we see. Whatever the case, we must pray that in each one of us is deposited the gift of the Holy Spirit so that we can start seeing what God sees, so that we can start appreciating ourselves, so that we can start appreciating others, 
so that we can also appreciate the work that other people do so that we can appreciate people's gifts without getting emotional without getting insecure if she can sing very well she has a gift that's her gift i can't fight her because she is singing very well if he can dance very well i can't fight him for dancing very well i know i can do something else I've always said that people who are immature in faith and emotions they fight each other because of the giftedness dear good people all of us are gifted next sunday we'll be talking about the divine trinity with their roles and again we'll also be reminded that each one of us has a role distinct that i can do this and you cannot doesn't make you a bad person and that is exactly what we are being reminded that we will be doing so many good things but we also must know that our gifts are different but all of them build the kingdom of god dear good people let us do the best we can in our own small ways or big ways and more importantly let us celebrate each other let us celebrate each other when my sister has conquered let me go and celebrate with her when my brother is celebrating victory let me go and celebrate with him my breakthrough is coming my day of joy is coming my day of rejoicing is coming today it is you tomorrow or the day after is mine did you know there is a special blessing for those who take time to celebrate the blessings of others because because you can identify the good in others your day is coming and god will reward you don't mind not all of us were meant to get our breakthrough in the morning some of us we will get our breakthrough in the morning 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 all of you are young after college some of you want to get married there are some of you who get married immediately maybe even on your graduation they will be brought by the the spouses will come for them and then they go getting married by the time they are at home they are pregnant that's you others we work for some 4 3 4 years then they get married there are others who will still stay for some time the person who got married immediately after graduation and the one who is getting married after seven years their time is coming differently we cannot say that the one who got married immediately was more prayerful than i was no it is your time that has not come as long as you have done your part please don't mind it is god who does the placement remember god's time is not our time the moment we understand that we will never get ourselves troubled she is getting every accolade i'm not getting the accolade she is getting the accolade because it is her time continue doing the best that you can exercising the gift that you have all of us we build the kingdom of god if all of us were to wake up every day to go and do whatever we do for the greater glory of god we would be a happy people a happy family a happy church a happy nation how i pray that that day comes when all of us will be happy not because we have everything but because we have the presence of the spirit and we enjoy thank you may the almighty god bless all of us in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit